In this video, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know to master the topic of nuclear decay. You're gonna be able to describe all of the types of radioactive decay. And you're gonna be able to complete nuclear equations, which are as simple as making the top line balance and the bottom line balance. Watch to the end to make sure you can answer the hardest questions on nuclear decay. Unstable isotopes decay to become more stable. So to become more stable, a radioactive isotope can kick out an alpha particle, a beta particle or a gamma ray. An alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons, a beta particle is a high speed electron and a gamma ray is a high frequency electromagnetic wave. Subscribe to Gorilla Physics because on this channel I'm aiming to teach you the grade 9 material. Let's start by recapping some of the things that you should know before you start this presentation. Pause the video before you go on and see if you can answer these questions on the screen here. If you didn't get those, then watch the video on nuclear stability and how we describe isotopes using nuclear notation. So the term ionization means when an atom gains or loses electrons. Now here we're talking about when it gets hit by a radioactive particle such as an alpha, a beta or a gamma. And we're going to talk about those in depth in this video. State the number of protons in these isotopes. The number of protons is always going to be the smaller number. So in carbon there's 6, in the nitrogen there's 7 and in the uranium there's 92. So that is always going to be the smaller number because the big number, the mass number, is the number of protons plus neutrons. Calculate the number of neutrons in the free isotopes above. Well, that was 8, 7 and 143. And the way that you calculate the number of neutrons is that you take away the proton number, the smaller number, from the larger number. The larger number is protons plus neutrons, so it's the sum of protons plus neutrons. You just need to work out the number of neutrons in that question there. This is an alpha emitter, it's a little bit of uranium paint on the end of that object you can see in the middle of the screen. It's important to state the uranium is the radioactive isotope and the alpha is the radioactive particle emitted by it. It's inside what we call a cloud chamber with some alcohol vapour and it's leaving trails because it is ionising that alcohol as it goes through that. You can see that it doesn't get very far because it's ionising the air as it goes through it. So here's what you need to know about an alpha particle. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus. It's two protons and two neutrons. It's very highly ionizing as it has a two plus charge. Because it's made of two protons and it doesn't have any electrons, it has a charge of two plus. So it can ionize atoms very easily. It can attract those electrons from other atoms and leave them ionized. Because it's highly ionizing and importantly not because of its size, that's a commonly made error. Because it's highly ionizing, it has low penetration power. It can go about two to four centimeters in air and it would be absorbed by thin paper. It wouldn't actually get through the layer of dead skin cells on your skin. So we don't have to actually worry about alpha particles if they're outside of our body. And in fact, if we're more than four centimeters away from them, then they are very unlikely to hit us and ionize our cells. However, because it's very ionizing, if it gets inside the body, if it contaminates us through a cut potentially, or we swallow a emitter, then alpha particles can do a lot of damage because they're so highly ionizing. Here's an example of a nuclear equation, and I'm gonna teach you how to do these and how to solve these just coming up in this video, but I wanted to show you it now so that you understand what we're looking at. What you can see here is radium decaying into radon and it's kicking out an alpha particle. Now you need to memorize this bit of information, the notation for an alpha particle. That is a mass of four and a proton number of two. It has the Greek letter A for alpha, or you can write HE for a helium nucleus. But an alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons. What we have in this equation is just like in a chemical equation, we have before and we have after. So before the decay, we have an unstable isotope of radium that has 224 mass, that's 224 protons plus neutrons, and it has 88 protons. Now, four mass has left and two protons have left. So all we've done is we've balanced up the top line and the bottom line. So 88 protons become 86 protons plus two. So two protons have left in that helium nucleus. There's, a, there's been a mass of four removed from the nucleus. That's two protons and two neutrons left. So the top line reads 224 mass before, 220 after, plus the four that's left in the alpha particle. That's alpha radiation. And you need to memorize that code four and two alpha to be able to solve any questions on alpha radiation.
In this cloud chamber you can see both alpha and beta particles. The alpha particles are leaving the short fat trails. They're doing lots of ionization so they don't go very far. But the beta particles are leaving the thin and longer trails. They are doing less ionization and they have really high kinetic energies so they get quite far. They penetrate quite far through this alcohol vapor in the cloud chamber. Now a really cool thing about this demonstration is that this is all the radioactive particles that are just naturally in the air around us. We call it background radiation. It's quite a lot of it, eh? Here's beta. Now beta is a high speed electron which is kicked out from the nucleus. What actually occurs inside the nucleus is a neutron turns into a proton. So we actually gain a proton. But the mass number doesn't change. Let's talk about that in a moment. It's a high speed electron. It has a medium-ish ionizing power because it's minus one charge. So it isn't as charged as the alpha particle. Because it's moving at very high speeds as well, it's also very unlikely to interact with other atoms. It doesn't spend a lot of time near other atoms, so it doesn't ionize them very easily. So it has less ionizing power, let's say, than the alpha particle. Now, because it's not got very much ionizing power, it's got medium ionizing power, it's also got medium penetration. It sits in between alpha and gamma in terms of how penetrating it is and in terms of how ionizing it is. It will travel two meters in air, so it will actually not get very far in air either. So if we can make sure that we're over two meters away, we're very unlikely to be hit by beta particles. But it will be also be absorbed by two millimeters of aluminium. So if we were to get close to it, we, we could shield ourselves quite easily by using some aluminium or some other metal plates. And here's the decay equation. This is cobalt 60 decaying into nickel 60. And what is actually going on in this is that one of those neutrons is actually turning into a proton. You can see the number 60, the mass number, hasn't changed on either side of the equation. There are 60 protons plus neutrons in the cobalt, and there are also 60 protons plus neutrons in the nickel. But we have one more proton in the nickel than we did in the cobalt. So we have one fewer neutron. Now notice the beta notation and you need to memorize that. It has zero mass, it's zero protons plus neutrons and it has minus one proton number. So the proton number in this case is not really how many protons we have, but it's an indication of the charge on the particle. All you need to do if you're given this equation with some blanks is to make sure that the top line balance and the bottom line balance. A bit like atom economy in chemistry. So 60 equals 60 plus zero. 27 equals 28 minus 1. And this is really, really straightforward. And people just make the mistake because they kind of second guess themselves about this side of the equation. They often go for 27 equals 26 minus 1. That can be a really easy mistake to make, but whenever you're given one of these equations, just make sure the top line balances and the bottom line balances. And just treat them separately. It adds up to the right hand side. The sparks that you're seeing here are caused by cosmic showers. Cosmic showers are radiation that are caused from a gamma ray from space. No alpha or beta particles can reach us from space, so all of this radiation is caused by gamma radiation emitted from the sun. Now, gamma radiation is high energy electromagnetic radiation emitted from the nucleus. So just to become more stable, an isotope can actually just give out some electromagnetic radiation. And it's very high frequency because there's lots of energies involved. And we give it the notation zero and zero because it's got zero mass and it's uncharged. So it has zero proton number. It's a photon of high frequency electromagnetic radiation. Because it's got no charge, it's got low ionization power. So it's unlikely to ionize any atoms. It's the lowest ionizing, so it's also the highest penetration. Because it doesn't interact with many atoms, it will go through just about anything. It will go basically forever in air. You need very, very thick lead or very, very thick concrete to actually absorb any significant proportion of, of gamma. So although this is ionizing radiation, it's not very ionizing. It's weakly ionizing when compared to the other two. However, it does go straight through lots of objects and it's very difficult to shield ourselves against it. So it can be dangerous for that reason. Essentially, gamma radiation is dangerous in high concentrations. Because although one individual gamma photon is unlikely to do an ionization, if you have many, many, many of them, then you're going to get many ionizations of atoms. And that can kill cells or lead to cancer. There's one more radiation that you need to be aware of, and it won't come up very often, but it is actually in the GCSE, and you do need to be aware of it. It's neutron emission. So sometimes an isotope can become more stable by simply getting rid of a neutron. It has too many neutrons, so it can get rid of one, and it leaves behind a more stable nucleus. The neutron notation would be one in the mass number, because a neutron has a mass of one, but zero in the proton number, or zero in the charge number, if you like, and a little n. 
and it's a single high energy neutron. Now it can do ionizations, but very, very weakly. And how it would do that is because of what we call secondary effects, but you don't need to be worried too much about the mechanism of how these things are ionizing. Essentially, it's just emitted to allow the nucleus to become more stable. It's very weakly ionizing, but it is more penetrating than alpha and beta. It's not as penetrating as gamma though. And the reason why it can cause ionizations and other effects is it can be captured by other nuclei, causing them to become unstable. One isotope that does undergo neutron emission to become more stable is helium-5. So helium-5 is unstable when compared to helium-4. So it can just get rid of one neutron and it becomes helium-4 plus a neutron. Again, if you were given this, you need to make sure you memorize the neutron code and that you can simply substitute that in and make the top line balance and make the bottom line balance. That's all there really is to nuclear equations. I just want to draw something for you because you'll see this loads in textbooks and other explanations. And essentially it just is a diagrammatic way of showing the penetration of alpha, beta and gamma. So alpha would actually be stopped by the fin paper. So we could draw a line showing how an alpha particle would actually be stopped by this fin paper. Beta would go through that fin paper, most of them would anyway, and it would be stopped by the two millimeter aluminium. But gamma would go actually through the paper and through the aluminium and most of it, in fact a lot of it would actually go through the lead but it would be attenuated, it would actually be reduced, the signal strength would be reduced by the lead. So we could show like this that most of it is going to be stopped by some thick lead, but not all of it. Now this is just to really show you that's what those drawings really mean. Penetration and ionization are actually really closely linked. So it is because the alpha is ionizing that it doesn't get through thin paper and it doesn't get through very far in air. As it moves through air or as it moves through paper, it ionizes loads. So it actually deposits a lot of its kinetic energy by doing collisions with other things. It interacts with a lot of the atoms, so it doesn't get very far. It's not because of its size. Now, actually, it is actually dangerous because of its ionization and not dangerous because of its penetration. So you have to think of the risks in terms of whether or not it gets inside the body. If it gets inside the body, then it can be very, very damaging because it can be really close to cells and do a lot of ionizations. But if it's outside the body, it's unlikely to get into the body. A beta is quite penetrating and quite ionizing, so it's pretty dangerous overall. But it doesn't make it more dangerous than alpha or less dangerous than gamma. It's dangerous depending on the situation. It will get through your skin and it will do ionizations. Not as many ionizations as alpha, but it's more likely to get into the body. So there's this kind of balance between penetration and ionization. Now again, it is not very penetrating because it is ionizing. And its ionizing ability is due to it having charge, but it has less charge than the alpha, but it's also moving very, very quickly. So it's unlikely to do ionizations because of its speed. It doesn't spend a lot of time near atoms. Gamma doesn't have a charge, so isn't likely to do ionization, except if it were to hit an electron, it would remove that electron from the atom. So it can do ionization because of that. It can also disrupt the nucleus and change the structure of the nucleus, a gamma can. And actually if a gamma ionizes an atom, then it releases an electron with a lot of kinetic energy and that electron can go on and do other ionizations as well. So there's a whole load of things that can happen because of gamma. You have to not think about this in a simplistic kind of way, that actually the penetration and ionizing abilities are actually linked. It is not that one is more dangerous than another because it's more ionizing or it's more penetrating, but the two have to be taken together to work out the overall risk of alpha, beta or gamma. So what can you do so far? Pause the video now and check that you can do these things because this is what you should have got from the video so far. So you state the names of these three radioactive particles and you need to memorize these codes. So alpha is four and two, four mass and two proton number. Beta is a high speed electron, so it's minus one charge and zero mass. And gamma has no charge and no mass. You need to make sure you can put them in order from most ionizing to least ionizing. Alpha is the most and gamma is the least ionizing. And you need to be able to order them in terms of most penetrating to least penetrating. So gamma is the most penetrating and alpha is the least penetrating. So the risk is based on a balance of the ionization and penetrating. They're all as risky as each other. There is no one most risky radioactive particle. 
So a typical question with decay equations is going to ask you to complete it. They're going to give you the start, they're going to give you the starting isotope, and they're going to give you the letter, the symbol for the second one, because you don't need to look that up in physics. But you just need to make sure that you complete the numbers in the decay equations. You'll be likely to be given the starting isotope and the final isotope, and you're likely to be given what type of radiation it is, what type of radioactive particle it is. And you need to have memorized the codes for these, beta, alpha, and potentially neutron emission. And you need to, first of all, write that code in. So remember that a beta is minus one proton number, zero mass. And then you need to make the top line balance and the bottom line balance. So 14 equals 14 plus zero. 6 equals 7 minus 1. It is exactly the same for alpha, but you need to remember that it's an alpha, so you use 4 and 2. Mass number of 4, proton number of 2. You write that code in, and you make the top line balance and the bottom line balance. So 240 equals 236 plus 4. 94 equals 92 plus 2. For neutron emission, it's the same idea. You simply write down the code for a neutron, that's one mass, zero protons, and you make the top line balance and the bottom line balance. 13 is 12 plus one. Four is four plus zero. You can check these really easily. They are super easy questions to get two marks in. It's just making sure top line balances and bottom line balances. Stick around though, because I'm gonna do some hard ones at the end. Here's three for you to have a little go, have a little practice. You can see there are blanks for you to fill in and the blanks don't necessarily have to be on the right hand side or the left hand side. The top one you've worked out that the number there needs to be zero because 14 equals 14 plus zero and therefore you've worked out that it's a beta you filled in that code and you've also worked out that to balance the bottom line you have to have six equals seven minus one now this is an alpha so the first step would be to actually write in the alpha code and then it's a case of balance the top line and balance the bottom line 238 is 234 plus four 92 is 90 plus 2. For the nickel, well actually they've told you it's a gamma, so you fill in the gamma, 0 and 0, and then that means the rest is unchanged. We don't often write gamma decay equations, but I think it's useful to, for you to have the idea that nickel has actually changed in terms of it has become more stable. It's lost some energy, so it's become more stable in that decay, it's just that the overall proton number and neutron number haven't changed. An individual nuclear decay equation is not a very difficult question, but one way they can make it more challenging is to actually give you a decay series. And uh, here's three of the questions that are about decay series. So it's not the case then that an individual nuclei just decays once and then it's stable and then that's this story done. Actually, it can take a few decays before it reaches to be a stable isotope. So this first one is about a uranium decaying four times to get back to uranium, but a different isotope of uranium. If you feel really confident with this, then pause the video and have a go with these and if you're not so sure then watch me do the first one and then hopefully you can pause and have a go at the second one they are getting progressively harder though and these are pretty challenging questions first question says uranium 238 decays to uranium 234 and they've given you the decay above there you just need to work out what the decay is at each step of the decay chain and you need to write a nuclear equation for each so let's just work through this one together then so we start with uranium 238 and that decays to thorium 234, which is number 90. So what needs to go here to make this balance? Well, this has been reduced by four, and this has been reduced by two. So that is an alpha decay. The next step is that that thorium 234 decays into protactinium 234. What needs to go here to make the top line balance and the bottom line balance? Well, 234 is 234 plus zero. 90 is 91 minus one, so that's a beta. The next one, 234, 91 protactinium is going to decay into uranium. So 234, 92 uranium. And what needs to go here to make that balance? Well, 234 plus 200, well, 234 equals 234 plus zero. 91 is 92 plus minus one, so that's beta. We've identified alpha, beta, beta in that decay chain, and now we have all three of our balanced nuclear equations for those decays. So this one says complete the decay series, and they could give us the whole list of them and we'd need to work them all out. What I'm going to do here just to make a point is to show you the kind of shortcut if you are given a list of different decays like this and you can work out what the final product is. So I'm just going to do a kind of overall equation if you like. Uranium 235, and that's number 92, and you're told that in the question that the protons in uranium is 92. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven alphas 
and four beaters. So a little bit like a chemical equation, I can write a big letter there to a big number there. So a little bit like a chemical equation, I can write a big number there to indicate there's been seven alpha particles and four beta particles. Well, what needs to go here? Well, that's again, this would make top line and bottom line balance. So seven multiplied by four is the total reduction in the top line. Seven by four is 28. So 235 minus 28 is 207 and it's lead. And now I can work out what the proton number is for lead. We've got seven lots of two plus four lots of minus one. So two times seven is 14 minus four. So that would be take away 10, so 82. And indeed 82 is the proton number of lead. You don't have a periodic table in a physics exam, so you weren't expected to just look that up. You're expected to work that out using this list here. You could actually write every single one of those equations and work that out, but here's a shortcut. So we're gonna use that shortcut here to work out the numbers of alpha and beta decays. So let's write what we know about this. We know we're starting with thorium-232 and we're told that there are 90 protons in thorium, so that's that value there. That decays to lead 208, and we're told there are 82 protons in lead. So we need to work out how many alpha decays there's been, and we need to work out how many beta decays here. So in other words, we need to work out this number here. Now the easiest way to do this is to first of all do the top line because we know that the beta decay doesn't change the top line. The beta decay doesn't change the mass number. So how what has the mass number decreased by? It's decreased from 232 to 208. It's decreased by 24. So divide that by four because that's the change of an individual alpha particle and we can see therefore there's been six alpha particles released from that nucleus. Now we know how many alpha particles there are, we can know how much that has changed the bottom line. So we've lost six lots of two, we've lost 12 from the bottom line. But if we'd lost 12, then 90 would have changed to 78. It hasn't, it's still at 82. So it's actually increased by four over the course of this series of decays. So actually the value there is four is because we have had four beta particles. We've had four lots of minus one taken away from our starting proton number. Now, if that didn't make sense, then you can check this again by making sure top line and bottom line balance. 232 equals 208 plus six times four. Certainly does equal 232. 90 equals 82 plus six times two plus four times minus one. So let's check that. Yes, it does indeed equal 90. So all of this is about making sure the top line and the bottom line balance. That's the key with nuclear decay equations. All you need to do is memorize your codes, make sure the top line and the bottom lines balance. A key point about radioactive decay is it's random. We can never predict when an individual radioactive nucleus will decay. Radioactive decay is random. That means it only depends on the nucleus. It cannot be influenced by external factors. And we'll use this idea of the random nature of radioactive decay in the next video when we explain what we mean by the term half-life, which is a term we use to describe how long something will stay radioactive for. If that was helpful, don't forget to hit the like button and just comment boom in the comment section below. Radioactive decay is random and radioactive isotopes decay to become more stable. An unstable isotope decays to become more stable and it can decay by alpha, beta or gamma radiation. Thanks very much and don't forget to subscribe to Gorilla Physics. Subscribe to Gorilla Physics because on this channel I'm aiming to teach you the grade 9 material.